So what does financial advisor excellence look like? We're going to talk about that in this video, but we're going to talk about it from the client's perspective, not the industry's. So if you've ever wondered in the minds of a client, when they say, I want comprehensive financial services, have you ever stopped and wondered what do they mean by that? Like what's happening in their mind? Of course, in the industry, if you're a financial advisor and you've been around the block, you've had some experience in the industry and you've got some skills in some area of personal finance, of course, you're going to have an opinion about that, but we're not dealing with that in this video. We are going to be talking about what does excellence look like to clients. All right. One thing as a starting place for this topic that you need to understand, and it's only because I got into this business on April 28th of 1981. So I've been in this business for a while, but the one thing that I've noticed over time is that professional standards have changed. We've had, think about it, since 1981, what's changed? For one thing, we have computers now. You realize when I got into this business, yes, we had computers on Wall Street and we had computer systems that managed trades and so forth. I came up through the investment management side of our industry. Yeah, we had computers off at the corporation somewhere, but we didn't have computers sitting on our desks. Nothing of the sort. I had a calculator. And that was pretty much it in the eighties. So have you ever thought, what did a financial advisor do when a client, before there were desktop computers, when a client said, I would like comprehensive financial services. I'm here to tell you that my training coming out of college, I attended grad school, went in to work for a wall street based firm. The standards were very clear back then. And it was that a client is in essence communicating that when they want comprehensive financial services, they are expecting both strategies and tactics. So we're going to talk for a minute about what do these terms mean? Because I believe because standards have changed over the decades, just even the definitions of these terms may have gotten a little bit fuzzy. And with the advent of not only computers, but I saw the biggest change professionally with the advent of software. So software becomes, it does a lot of work for the professional. Let's put it that way. So if you're a, a tax accountant, I think you'd have to agree tax software helps a lot. If you're an estate planning lawyer, <laughs> there's a lot of estate planning these days that you collect in the software and you build wills and trusts and powers of attorney and all that sort of thing out of, in essence, libraries. And then you deploy your skill. In financial planning, I was around not only before computers, but I remember the very first financial planning software that was available to the industry and we used it, but things change. There's like before software and after software. So what we're going to focus on here is we're going to, I want you to appreciate how things were done before there was software because it's going to go straight to the point of what the instinct of the client is when they are considering what is financial advisor excellence and what does the client mean when they talk about comprehensive financial services, but delivered in a way that will consistently exceed their expectations. Okay. It's the development of strategies and tactics. Now a strategy, just to focus on that term for a minute, what, what is the strategy? How would you answer that? And I'm not looking it up in the dictionary on purpose. I'm giving you my definition, the way I interpreted it coming up in a world without desktop computers. Back in the day, a strategy was always considered as a plan to get you from po point A to point B. So you have, let's call point A where you are now, meaning the client. So here's where the client is now. Let's call point B where they would like to be in the future. So the strategy is explain to me how I'm going to get from point A to point B. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about point B because we're typically not just talking about one objective with a client in financial services. We're, we're talking about a client who's got multiple objectives. If you're a financial planner, you might call them goals, but there are different objectives depending on which area of personal finance we're talking about.
But in general, strategies are forget the software, forget the data entry, forget when a client says, do you create a strategy for me? And you're thinking, yeah, I enter all your data into the software. I create scenarios. I hit print figuratively and I get, let's call it a PDF, maybe 80 pages of a PDF which sort of explain the charts and graphs and the boilerplate of the plan. Scrap that. I want you to think before computers, how did it make sense to clients? So when a client says, have you created a strategy for me? Here's what they mean. They mean being that you're crystal clear on where I am as a client now, and now you're crystal clear as a, me as a client where I want to be in the future, then explain to me, don't print out charts, explain to me all the moving parts around how we're going to get from point A to point B and how am I going to achieve all my goals and the strategy is going to explain along the way, meaning over time on the journey, what's the measure of success? In other words, will I be able to sit down with you uh, several times a year? And the minute I sit down, you're going to tell me, well, of your X number of goals, let's say I have three goals over time of your three goals, these two are on track and this one's off track. However, here's the revised strategy to get you back on track so that you'll still achieve your goal, the point B out in the future. So that's the strategy. The strategy is an explanation of how we're going to get from point A to point B but not so fast. When a client says comprehensive financial services, you have to jump in their head and sort of deconstruct what are they talking about? What does that actually mean? In the industry, there is no defined meaning for this term, comprehensive financial services. It's right. I've, I have other videos on this because I've always thought it was funny uh, because I did a very deep dive on this topic back 25 years ago and only to discover to my surprise that it is a marketing term more than anything else. And that when a firm says we provide comprehensive financial services, it definitely means different things to different firms. And so as a client has to get crystal clear on what it means, but we're sticking with what clients mean. So the more affluent, the more successful the client, the more they think like I'm about to describe to you. So yes, they want an explanation in writing for how we're going to get from point A to point B, which is where we want to be someday, but not just in one area. When we talk about comprehensive financial services and we survey large numbers of affluent client, potential clients, and so how do you define comprehensive financial services? It tends to be in five basic areas, and these will not come as a surprise to you, but let me walk through them. You need to be prepared that in the mind of a client, they expect, and they frankly think this is happening behind the scenes anyway. And if only they knew this is almost never happening actually behind the scenes. But behind the scenes, they believe there's a strategy for, yes, financial planning, meaning a, pl a plan to get to each of the goals. So the financial planning focusing on, yes, on goals and financial planning also focuses on, let's call it the financial planning process, but the outcome is to make better financial decisions overall not just to get you to the goals, but along the way, you're making smarter decisions financially. Okay, so they expect that you will have a financial planning strategy. But in addition, there will be a separate money management, or let's call it investment management strategy, and a separate tax strategy, and a separate estate planning strategy, and then a separate strategy, and it's described different ways by different clients, but let's call it a risk and safety strategy. In our industry, we would probably lump it into insurance, but it's far greater than insurance in the client's mind. They think behind the scenes, what you've created for them is a comprehensive written lifetime financial planning process strategy and a comprehensive written lifetime investment management strategy and a comprehensive written lifetime tax strategy and a comprehensive written lifetime estate planning strategy. And then that after all that's created, that your team has sat down and created a comprehensive written lifetime 
strategy for safety, to increase the safety of the overall plan now that it exists. Once the plan exists, there are pitfalls and risks and things that could blow up the strategy along the way. The client thinks in a high-end environment where you've got a high-end advisor pledging high-end services, that after the strategies are created, that there is an effort to sit down and through insurance and other ways to mitigate risk, that there is a strategy in place to improve the safety of the overall plan now that it exists. Okay. Now the question is, is this true? If the client is thinking that because you're offering comprehensive financial services, you have a separate strategy for each of these five areas. I don't know about you and your experience in our industry, that's almost never true. There's some elements of this. It may be that each of these areas is considered, but let's talk about this term that I'm using, comprehensive written lifetime strategy. What does that mean? Comprehensive is in the client's mind, a quite a big term that in the mind of the advisor, we may be looking at their situation and understanding where they want to be. And we're trying to tell them, here's what you need to do right here, right now. Here's some changes you need to make in your, whatever your tactics, your action items, things that you're doing in your financial life. Here's what you need to do a little different and a little better to get you on track to your goals. Okay, fine. That's not what the client means when they think comprehensive, what they mean when they hear you say comprehensive is that yes, of course, you're going to look at their current situation and make recommendations right here, right now of anything that needs to be improved and, and done as far as action items now. However, two things that are often missing, uh, when the client says comprehensive, they also mean that you are looking at not just the here and now you're looking across their lifetime. So if they have some moving part in their financial situation, that's going to have a significant impact down the road in some manner, maybe it's taxes, maybe it's estate planning, but something about their circumstances, there, there is a point in the future where something is significant, either is going to happen or might happen. They think when you say comprehensive, you're documenting all of that at the same time, you're making action items and recommendations related to what happen, needs to happen now, but also what might, what will need to happen in the future. Now they may, they, they don't necessarily expect that you drill down exactly the date that it has to happen, but they do expect that you are aware of this future event that because of their circumstances with their holdings, they are likely facing and they want to be aware of it now and basically what the plan is then it's okay to be a little more in general terms, but they'd like to know as specifically as possible, when is this going to happen? And what's the impact on my strategy of that future event? So one aspect of comprehensive beyond just here and now is the future, the lifetime of the client. And keep in mind, many clients, most fam, most clients in my case are married. So it's two lifetimes. So you've got two clients in, in a typical family that you need to be envisioning their entire lifetime based on their situation, their future goals with the current holdings that they've got. All right. So that's one aspect of it. That's often missing the lifetime. The second thing is I, I call it horizontal comprehensiveness, and it is envisioning all the other areas of the client's financial life other than the area being looked at. So let me give you an example. Let's say you're the financial planner. Let's say you're a certified financial planner and you're creating the component of this massive strategy that just focuses on the financial planning. So you're creating the comprehensive written lifetime financial planning strategy. And so you've created a plan to get from point A to point B where the client is now versus where they want to be in the future. But you need to comment in your strategy about any overlap with the other areas as the client is implementing action items to move towards their goals. Will there be any tax consequences along the way? What's that strategy or how are you as a financial planning strategist overlapping with the client's tax strategy and the tax team? 
to mitigate or to optimize would be a great word. The financial planning strategy as it relates to tax. How about the financial planning strategy as it relates to estate planning? How about the uh, financial planning strategy as it overlaps with insurance? So you get the idea. There's all these five areas of finance and yes, you need to create and explain, here's the client plan to get you to your objectives. Here are the things you can expect over your lifetime and the basic strategy that you've got in your mind, just explaining it to them. And then here are the overlaps of this, whatever strategy it is with the other areas. So let's say you're an estate planning lawyer and you're creating the comprehensive written lifetime estate planning strategy. Well, then you do the same thing, lifetime of the client, things that need to happen here and now to align the actions with the client's objectives. But what are the estate planning overlaps with tax? Now, tax is also a very broad term. There's not just income taxes. There are estate taxes down the road. For that matter, there are sales taxes, property taxes. So the question is for each of these areas, what's the overlap with tax, with money management, with estate planning, with risk and safety, with overlap with insurance? So are you creating a strategy that thorough across five areas? There should be five siloed separate strategies, at least the way the client's thinking of it. So the question is, are you doing that? If you want to be aligned with affluent clients, that's what you'll do. Now that's the strategy. Now back before computers, we had strategies and tactics. So if strategies are nothing more than explaining the plan of how we're getting between two points, A and B, where we are now, where we want to be in the future, then what are tactics? Very simple. Tactics typically fall into two categories. They are action items or recommendations. So I want you to picture in each of these five areas, they've, each area has created a standalone strategy, which is envisioning the overlap with the other four strategies uh, in a seamless way. Now that's complete. Each of the five areas needs to envision and create tactics in order to implement each of these strategies. So what are the action items? What are the recommendations? What does the client actually have to do like actions? to implement this and to keep it on track. So those are the tactics. Now, what the client's hoping is that they get over the course of every single year, a set of knock your socks off recommendations. And one of the things about professional standards having changed over the last 30 years that I've noticed is in the area of tactics. So what we think in the in financial services as what are the action items and recommendations? Well, we, especially since the advent of software, we have started collecting what I would call best practices in each of these five areas that if we have a client in this situation with these objectives, with these holdings, here are the typical, let's call it routine or boilerplate. You could call them best practices actions that a client in this situation should take. And in the mind of the client, they don't count those. You could put them in the category of generally acknowledged routine boilerplate recommendations in tax, financial planning, investment management, insurance, and so forth. So this is not what the client is thinking of when they think tactics, what they are thinking of, they assume they're going to get all of those from you. As a matter of fact, if you're wondering why they hired you over the competition, because an affluent, successful client can hire anybody that they want, they can afford anybody. Why did they pick you? Because they were assuming that in addition to the routine or boilerplate recommendations that they would get some number of, let's call it knock your socks off, recommendations that rise to a little bit higher level, recommendations that can only be made with someone who has experience in their field and skill. So above average technical skill plus experience and, and understanding of affluent clients, which is, let's call it recommendations that are a little bit above and beyond the call of duty. and. They're hoping to get at least 
three a year. Now in our method, the method that I've always taught after we figured all this out, we recommend a three meeting process where you meet with an affluent client every four months without fail. But that's just our system. If you're wondering why did we pick that three meeting process cycle, it's when we drilled down and we realized that at the bottom line, if they're being very honest with you, an affluent client that's paying an above average fee, they expect at least three times a year to get a recommendation to the point where when they read it, they keep in mind, they've read all these boilerplate and, and the, the routine ones. So they see those, but they dismiss them in their mind and they're going through all your action items. And then they come across this one and they read it and their reaction as they go through it with you is that is a great idea. I would have never thought of that. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad I hired your firm. That right there is the reason I hired your firm. So you're looking for that emotion. You're looking for the affluent client to say, wow, that was really, that required some skill and experience. It was very thoughtful. It was custom tailored to my situation and my family's needs. Thank you. Well, they're looking for a minimum of three of those per year. Now, here's the problem. If we had for each of these five areas, let's say we had five subject matter experts who are deep experts in each of the five areas. And let me pause there just long enough to say, when I got into the business, it never occurred to anybody that a single individual could have deep experience and deep expertise in all of these five areas. The idea back in when I got into the business in 1981, that you'd have a single financial advisor saying, oh yeah, I'm skilled and experienced. I'm quite expert in the area of financial planning. Okay, fine. And we're a one-stop shop, which means I also have deep experience and tremendous skill in the area of tax law, creating planning, tax planning, and monitoring it over time as tax laws change as complex tax laws change. And I'm also skilled and experienced when it comes to estate planning. Estate planning is quite complex. Again, there are many laws and lots of different strategies and every state does it a little bit different way. But I am an expert in all of those areas, including money management. Did I mention that I have deep skill and tremendous amount of experience in investment management? So I can recommend investments that are uh, appropriate and suitable to achieve everything that you're trying uh, to achieve, keep you on track and make changes, buy, sell, hold recommendations along the way to keep you on track to your goals. Oh, and did I mention insurance? I have deep experience, deep skill in the area of insurance and risk and safety. Forget it. Back in the eighties, that would have been ludicrous. Nobody would have even attempted to, to say something so ridiculous. Over time, things have changed. We have the advent of the certified financial planner and granted certified financial planning does deal with all of these areas, but expert skill. I mean, if we're being honest, I think we'd all agree that even if you're a certified financial planner or it doesn't matter, let's say you're a certified public accountant and an expert in the area of tax, you got to admit that <laughs> There's some of these other four areas that you have less than less skill and experience than the client would expect. Maybe it's in the area of investment management. Maybe it's in, in the area of estate planning. Whatever it is, all I'm saying is what we did not make the mistake of back 30 years ago and more is to presume that and to claim to the client that we are a jack of all trades. And we have deep skill, deep experience in all of these areas. So what the client's expecting is you've got a team with a very deep bench. You may be an expert in whatever it is, financial planning, estate planning, whatever your specialty is. But for three or four of the other areas, you've deployed a team. You've got a team in place where they've got deeper ex expertise, a lot more skill, in these other narrow fields that frankly are not your strength. Now you may have experience in all of these areas, but let's be honest, could you find somebody with deeper skill and more experience in some of these other areas? Well, the client thinks so. The client's very skeptical and untrusting of a one man band. I'll put it to you that way. The data bears me out on this. You might actually be a one man band and highly skilled. It's just that in the mind of the client, they don't believe it. So you're way better off 
building a team of at least three, we recommend that you have five subject matter experts to cover all five of these areas. If you want to be one of them or two of them, that's fine. But the more you do that, the, le the more skeptical the client is. The less you do that and the more you have a, a team with a deep bench, the better you're off you are. But the point is you've got tactics for each of these five strategies. And if you've got five subject matter experts responsible for five different strategies and you tell them, look, the client's looking for at least three knock your socks off recommendations or else they're not going to pay the fee that we're charging, which is substantially higher than the average. The only way we're going to keep these clients to pr provide excellence in the way they're envisioning it is to provide them with at least three knock your socks off recommendations from each of these five areas annually. And to get that, I need each of you to provide at least three each so that when the client looks at the three that you think are above average, so you're submitting three as one of the SME subject matter experts, and you say these three are above average. They're without question. They're, they should be knock your socks off, not routine, not boilerplate, took some thought, took some skill and experience. Here are my three. I've got data to back up the fact that the, that, that the likelihood is the client would look at those three and they would just find one impressive. So out of every three that the industry thinks are impressive in the mind of the client, uh, one of them is, one of them isn't. And the other one might be impressive to us inside the industry, just not something the client values tremendously. So, Live with that. When you know that only one out of three recommendations that are meant to be a cut above are uh, up to the client standards that will keep them paying the fees over time, you're going to put higher standards on each of these five areas of finance. You're going to build a team with a deeper bench so that you've got more people looking at more things in the client situation and coming up with multiple impressive above average recommendations and action items, which represent the tactics, the action items that are required to implement the strategy that's updated annually. So have a team, have your team develop lots of action items, set the expectation that over the course of a year, there should be nine or 10, I would say a minimum of 10 from each of the five areas that are in their opinion above average, you're meeting with the client three times a year. If you'll have a standard like that and you'll have your team updating the strategy annually, now you've set a scenario that is perfectly aligned with excellence in the mind of the client. But don't m be mistaken, this is not what the client thinks is unusual. What I just described, they think this is already happening. They think it's being done sort of the way they intuitively think it should be done. And it actually was done this way before computers, but over the course of time and things have changed, standards have changed. Software has gotten us more focused on data entry and kind of boilerplate solutions. And we focus more on the money and the numbers and the scenarios than we do on the people. And if you can kind of get away from that and think, how did they do this before computers? Well, it was just simply five expert financial planning, money management, insurance, tax, and estate planning experts sitting down and pausing and explaining, here's where you are now. Here's where you need to be, or have shared that you want to be in the future. And in each of these five areas, here's how you're going to get there. We got you covered. We've got your back. There will be no financial surprises. We are so proactive and you will look at this process and think, wow, I'm making better financial decisions in all areas of my financial life than I ever have before. There you have it. There you've got what excellence looks like, at least in the mind of the client.